Nature's beauty. Nature's fury. To know her intimately, you must experience her extremes. There are no rules, no boundaries, no timeouts. Action heroes in the flesh, those who dare to push the limits, reap the rewards. But the bottom line, however, is that living this close to the edge, an error can prove fatal. From high above the earth to deep beneath the sea, prepare to dive into the action and be as close as you can get. The science of extreme sports. Alaska's Chugach mountain range, the last frontier, avalanches, explosions, helicopter operations, and death-defying mountaineering are all in a day's work for backcountry heli-ski guide Dean Cummings. In an icy environment that offers no mercy, to survive ski descents down the planet's steepest slopes, while entrusted with the lives of his high-paying clients, Dean relies on snow science, a guide's best insurance policy for safe passage and thrilling adventure in a world of such extreme exposure. World Extreme Skiing Champion Dean Cummings is a backcountry skiing pioneer, making more first descents on Alaska's steep virgin slopes than anyone. In this playground of endless white powder, Dean and his team at H2O Guides, Alaska's premier helicopter skiing operation, follow strict backcountry safety protocol to lead his clients through the most incredible snow terrain on the planet. It's amazing how much terrain we have up here. It's all about aircraft access. The lands here are so remote and so deep. It would take you three weeks just to get into uh, one of these mountains to ski it. Valdez at sea level had 33 feet of snow this winter. Up high we have 70 to 80 feet of snow. It's the longitude, latitude, altitude, and the young geology of these mountains. Uh, the interconnected ridge systems, it's amazing. There's nothing that compares. Big mountain skiing entails a lot of things. Route selection, glacier travel, knowing your fall lines, knowing your exposures. Conditions warrant what you can ski and what you can't ski. When guys pick a line and it's gonna demand a lot of speed, they're really sure of what they're doing before they do it. It's pretty impressive to watch a guy running at 70 miles an hour off 48 degree slopes, 2,000 feet above the world. But when things go wrong at high speeds off big mountains, there's a really good chance you'll unhook from the mountain and never hook back up. Incredible moves in big mountain skiing are landing in a place where if you fall, you possibly die or are seriously injured. It's all about making sure that everything's right before you drop in. Because once you leave the ridge, there's no calling it back. When I look up at a mountain, I'm looking for steep lines, I'm looking for technical lines. I like to do things that uh, really challenge everything I know and have learned and demand every tool I have in my pack. If I like to think of a slope as like, wow, no one's ever been here and chances are no one ever will be. 
These are the kind of slopes it may take you six years to do, but they're worth the wait. smooth and fast, but also has a base so you don't have to hop your turns. You can actually steer through the snow and, and run at speeds you could never even think of in other places. Slough management is really important in Alaska. When you ski after, say, your 10th turn, you have so much snow running with you, it's like being in an avalanche. You've got to understand where to be and where not to be. Anytime you're skiing a big mountain, you want to be like, okay, if this thing went, where would I want to end up? Definitely not at the bottom with an avalanche. How quick will it get up to 100 miles an hour? Do I have enough speed? enough angle to point it to that safe zone and end up in the right place if it went. The worst scenario there is, is actually leaving unstable snow above you and getting below it. Next thing you know, you're a thousand feet below it and you've got this unstable slope above you. Pretty basic line, but if it slides, it's, it's all gonna funnel into that one spot. So that's my only concern really. The concern is where the slough avalanche will carry you, especially if there are cliffs or dangerous exposures below. Guiding in the Chugach Running Valdez is unmatched. It's the best skiing in the world, hands down. And what creates this incredible snow is the storms coming off of Siberia, Japan, and sometimes even Hawaii. But they'll come across the Pacific, get into the Gulf of Alaska, they'll cool down slowly, but then they'll hit the Prince William Sound. This is the area that's just fjords, islands, lagoons, and the peaks rise out of the ocean anywhere from three to 6,000 feet. This gives the storm time to slow down and actually really lay down some accumulation. Cold air from the glaciers and up from the northern canyons meet this and uh, just make it the most incredible snow. The first foot and a half is fairly wet and heavy and really sticks to things well and then finishes up light. Some areas will receive four feet of snow overnight, 10 feet over 24 hours period, well, another area just two miles away only gets like a foot or two feet. This translating into huge instability. And you gotta understand these corridors to understand where you're gonna have too much snow or where you're gonna have snow that you can actually deal with. We use radar imagery as a first means to understand what's coming in, what to expect in the day. We combine this with daily data from each guide and 
really try to compile this to understand what can we get away with, what can't we get away with before we go into the range. Avalanches don't happen by accident, they happen for a reason. That's why you train and try to understand the snowpack as much as you can. Powder avalanches are the fastest moving avalanches. They can travel up to 200 miles an hour. They also have an incredible wind blast in front of them. The thing can actually blow a house off its foundation or into smithereens before the snow actually gets there. Slab avalanches are the most humbling for a ski guide. They're hard to predict only because you're like, yeah, it feels good but you actually haven't felt the layer that's five feet down below unless you've dug a snow pit or had data to prove that theory. It's a very humbling thing to hear a mountain crack. It almost sounds like an explosion under your feet. Am I scared I'll be caught in an avalanche every time I go out? No. I go out knowing that I'm going to use every tool in my bag and every skill that I've learned to keep it safe and to minimize the risk. No, no, no. Being prepared for the winter demands a year-round process of staying in shape, staying on top of your skills. It's all about being prepared for that day when you need it. So I'm actually in a crevasse here. Imagine after you get 60 feet of snow, you have a bridge over this crack. This is where you could end up if you didn't uh, rope up or avoid this area. It's a nice thing to do to uh, check these things out when there's not much snow on the ground in the summer and in the fall. Definitely a beautiful but humbling world in here. Crevasses are uh, one of the most dangerous things in the mountains. I mean, falling in a crack like this one, you know, the odds of survival are, are very slim. It's usually a body recovery, not a, uh, a live recovery. There's only one way to understand crevasses is uh, Get in there and look at them, and learn all the uh, mechanical advantages of how to get somebody out of them. A lot of times people fall in a crevasse. They get wedged down in the bottom of the thing and they kind of melt into a locked position. And it makes it really difficult to get a hold of them, to anchor something to them, to yank them out. So some of the biggest hazards in big mountain guiding are uh, ice falls, crevasses, birch runs, avalanches of course, and unsupported snow slopes. There's so many things that can hammer you. So many dangers out there. You see this little flake of ice here? That thing's really, really holding well, but uh, if it was warmer or really going through some wicked temperature gradients, it could definitely be something to, to watch out for. Glacier ice uh, gets so compressed, it's almost like plastic. You get a good hit in the stuff, it's hard to even get your tool out. You can just hear it and feel that hit. It holds so well. This is one of many ways to use ice as an anchor. This is what we call a ballard. Well, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna chop out and leave like a perfect hook of ice here that the rope can sit on without pulling out and then you could repel off it or rescue somebody or anything like that. Oh yeah, this thing's solid. As long as you don't undermine the bottom side of it, we'll hold the car. Your harness, carabiners, your anchors, everything needs to be triple checked before you begin to repel off something. You know, uh, we try to do a rule where you uh, Get out of the range an hour before sunset. 
That gives you about two and a half hours of time to uh, pull anything off if something were to go wrong. But you better be equipped for the evening in case you do get stuck out. We put a full weight against this thing. We feel really good about it. These things are such solid anchors. Extreme, the highest degree, furthest, most severe science, a systemized knowledge of a state of mind or matter. Ski Mountain Guides carry a lot of weight in their pack. You're looking at a 20 to 30 pound pack. They're carrying a rope, crampons, ice axe, brussics, jumars, pulleys, food, warm gear, water, a shovel, a probe, a transceiver, first aid kit, a compass, a headlamp, extra batteries for your transceiver and headlamp, a radio, extra batteries for that radio. These are tools you use all the time. If you leave one of these tools behind, that's when you're going to need it. No, 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 no. Venturing into Alaska's backcountry requires an intimate understanding of snow conditions and weather patterns. Ski guides rely on snow science and terrain analysis techniques to safely travel through these mountains. When you dig a snow pit, you're trying to understand what the stability of the snowpack is and what's this going to do when we get 80 feet of snow on it. And there's lots of different uh, crystal formations that bond well. And there's lots of different crystal formations that don't bond at all that you really want to look for. In big mountains, aspects play a critical role. South and east facing slopes are the most dangerous. They get the most solar penetration. All day long, these slopes are being exposed to sunlight. You get a lot of metamorphic changes within the snowpack. Slick sun crust with new snow on it translates into avalanches. The typical slab avalanche scenario begins with a beautiful sunny day heating up the top snow layers, which then freeze overnight. Newly fallen snow builds up on this icy surface until its own weight exceeds its holding strength. So the snowpack's like looking at the rings of a tree. You can see every layer, find out exactly what's going on. There's a slight shear right there. Get the crystals that it slid on. And take a look through the microscope. Well, just under this three inches, we had an intensity change in the storm. This is grapple. Grapple comes down as in little pellets. It's a very weak layer. It's something to really look out for within the snowpack. There we go. And I call these an easy shear. You could definitely have high avalanche danger. Yeah, and these are uh, spatial dandrites. These make for weak layers. The information I want to find out is, is it going to propagate? And if it propagates, then it's very high avalanche danger. If it doesn't propagate, then you just know you got weak layers, but then you got good integrity within the snowpack bridging things. Everything else is pretty dang solid. Yeah. That's just a beautiful column of snow. This is what snowpack's supposed to look like. During and right after a big event, you'd better not be in the range. But after that, giving it some time to stabilize, you get good stability. Then you just gotta go back into your data and look, okay, where did we have weak layers? Where did we have sun crust? Where do we have metamorphosisms? So here you have uh, the beginning formations of a cornice. They break all the time. You can never trust a cornice. You see guys jumping a huge cornice, landing on a slope below it, and they survive and it's all good. But there's times when the whole cornice breaks off, releases the whole slope, and sweeps everybody away. If we didn't uh, control this cornice, it's, it'll get 60 feet tall, it'll stick way out, hang over the whole slope, and it can break off and hit somebody. No matter what the information you get on top of the mountain, it doesn't mean that it's going to be consistent throughout the whole descent. Yeah. 
Here I am down here on the lower part of the mountain, and I've got a whole new different layer. This is a wind slab. Watch out, it peels away. This propagated out, this crack, and you can see this uh, hard slab on top of the sun crust. What this tells me is you don't want to be skiing an east facing slope today. We found good stability in north, northeast, but east facing aspects are bad news. No reason to ski below things that you know are unstable. So what you'll do is you'll clean the slope as you go. And that means ski cutting it and making things slide as you go. But only in circumstances where you know you can handle what you're dealing with. And when you have any doubts on the stability of the snowpack, you gotta use your islands of safety, which we call safe zones. Sometimes you're not necessarily just skiing a whole mountain, you're actually mountaineering, making turns from rock to rock, knowing that if it slid, I could go from point A to point B, and I had enough speed to get off the slab before it could sweep me away. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the snowpack I'm seeing. It's all gonna depend on what happens from here on out with the uh, temperatures, wind, and how much snow we get. By the time we start guiding people, we'll have a pretty good understanding of what's below us, and then just keep track of what's coming in. High winds deposit previously fallen snow almost as much as a snowstorm. Scouting the slopes during a windstorm gives an understanding of where this loose snow is being deposited in large quantities. Areas which are the breeding grounds for large slab avalanches. Dean, Yeah, base. I just gained the ridge heading up Loveland. I'm about uh, 3,900 feet. Uh, winds are about 30 miles an hour out of the northeast, gusting up to 40, 50. I'll check in every 10 minutes. Got about a 40 mile an hour wind here. I'm gusting up to 50, 60 now, and uh, I'll keep checking in every 10 minutes. depositing here on this uh, south facing slope. This chute is so prime for an avalanche right now, it's not even funny. This is the classic example of wind loading and is definitely suspect to avalanche. This is impressive snow transport right now. I can cut a hole in the snow and that's gonna fill in within about a minute. Actually getting sun cooked. We had point releases and roller balls. That's a classic example that uh, the surface layers are getting warm and can translate into avalanches. Now we have a cold temperatures with wind transporting snow on top, loading it on those that sun crust. So this would be suspect. Yeah, one thing about mountains is uh, they tell you what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, we're up here to uh, cut this slope and get a feel for it, see if we could uh, clean it, but. Uh, there's way more loaded snow here than expected, and uh, we're going to give it respect and leave it be. Visibility down below is horrible. A really nice thing to do when you're dealing with something like this, fog or flat light or a whiteout, get a reading with our compass. So when we did get down in the clouds, we know exactly where to make it back to, uh, to base or to our car, whatever it may be.
spend your time in the mountains gathering information. So when it does clear, you've uh, got more knowledge of what to expect when you get there. No no Although Alaska is famous for extreme ski descents, it's also a paradise for recreational skiers seeking to understand more about the backcountry and access the ultimate in powder snow conditions. People are seeing terrain that 99.9% .9 of the world would never see without really good guides and aircraft access in some of these remote places like Alaska. Using the boat, the snowmobile, helicopter, and fixed wing, it's the only realistic access unless you have a month on your hands just to get there. A mountain guide or heli ski guide takes on a huge amount of responsibility. It's a very serious place, it's a very humbling place, but uh, with respect, patience, and teamwork, you can minimize the risk and really get after some incredible terrain. Feel good about what you're doing because you're sharing your knowledge with people and they they go away to their mountain range wherever they're from or their ski resort and they have a lot more understanding of wow you know hey uh, I'm not just gonna ski this shoot this time I'm actually gonna ski it and know what I'm doing beautiful Alaskan talcum powder this is God's country Dino mind. I'll remember this one for a lifetime life experience right here right now Best pro skiers work with their guides, they trust their guides, they, they team up. It's not just, hey, I'm the raddest skier in the world, I'm gonna point this thing. It's like, hey, Dean, what do you see in the snowpack? What do you think I should do when I get down to the rock buttress? It's about using every tool you have. Guiding clients or guiding professional skiers, it's all the same. You are out there to uh, make it as safe as you can in an environment that isn't exactly that safe. It's funny, like, you watch all these movies of like Alaska footage and everyone always skis around all the sick airs and stuff. You're like, how come they always ski around all the sick airs? Well, it's because you're looking at that. Can you see below you? No. Nothing. Zero. I have no idea where I'm gonna go. <laughs> A lot of times I can pretty much uh, understand what, where I'm going and what I'm doing just on the flight up. Uh, I like to go back to the Polaroid for you know anything that I'm not too certain about. When I entered the big mountains, I didn't know anything at all. And I miss those naive years because that's when I skied with no fear. But then I guess it's better to know what's going to happen and be a little scared and be aware of your environment. All my passion about skiing is about speed, so... Uh... Yeah, all I do is pretty much uh, try to rip peak as fast as I can and 
have big air on my way down. Working with the top ski mountaineers in the world is both exciting and challenging. But the ultimate test of Dean's guiding skills will be to host the World Extreme Skiing Championships. This particular competition has the word extreme in it, the World Extreme Skiing Championships. And extreme to us means you risk your life. competitor in the World Extreme Skiing Competition was fatally injured this morning. The skier was inspecting his possible run down the mountain when the fall occurred. After unsuccessfully attempting resuscitation for an hour, the doctor stated that the skier had died on impact. I think that Wes helped pen that name of Extreme. And after you see videos of Wes and the ski, it really meant something back then. Now it sounds like just sort of a cliche, it's extreme. Past years have proven that extreme skiing competition is not to be taken lightly, as the contest venues are located on some of the highest and most exposed peaks in the region. It is a very dangerous event. It has whooped up on some of the best skiers in the world. These mountains are huge and they demand respect and unfortunately the organization has suffered through a couple tragic accidents. And it's a challenge to pull off the, the logistics and the safety to get this event to the stage and get the curtain opened. The challenge to run this dangerous event requires extreme preparation and utilizes all of Dean's skills as a mountain guide. He has two conflicting goals. One is to create the most demanding and aggressive extreme skiing event in the world. And the second is to keep everyone alive, creating as safe an event as possible for the skiers, judges, pilots, media, and everyone else who is on the mountain. Conditions have been really tricky with all the new snow and with all the surface oil throughout the range. I've seen more avalanches this winter than I've seen my whole lifetime. When you go through a cycle like this, all you've got to do is take a step back and cover your bases. The snow safety side of WESC is our snow safety director and guides going out to check the snowpack with one goal, make sure that uh, we pick a venue that has decent snow and safe snow for the skiers, something they'll enjoy, but also something that has stability that if a guy jumps an 80-foot cliff, the whole slope doesn't pull out. Storms slam off the coast into here. You just load so much snow on the slope. I mean, look at that cornice. It's like 80 feet high. They're looking at controlling cornices, uh, looking out for seracs, crevasses, birch runs. These are the things that are dangerous. These are the things you look for and you try to minimize the risk for the competitors to deal with. Backcountry protocols apply here. This isn't the ski resort. You're not going to be controlling all the micro terrain on this venue. You're just emphasizing the cornice control, large faces, and protecting LZs and judges areas mostly. Sensitive cornices with all the new snow. They're so ready to fall. Just one charge sends these things off. This is a great stability test for, uh, for the snowpack to get an idea. Is this something that skiers can rip and not create a huge avalanche on? 
just yesterday, me and Tom were uh, scouting a venue for the skiers. And we were just going in to set, throwing a charge to see what kind of stability we have with the snow. I cut the slope. The whole mountain pulls out. Three foot fracture, 200 yards across, and here it's coming right at us. I'm moving on this block at about 3,000 vertical feet above the glacier. I'm just about to take a ride for my life. I'm saying, like, stay tough, stay tough, stay tough. The thing parts around us and just blows 3,000 vertical feet. I mean, this thing was big enough to wipe out a third of the town of Valdez. When you see a plume of smoke going to the air a quarter mile from an avalanche you just kicked out, it just really brings things back to everything you've learned, everything you know in the mountains. The mountain always wins. I've seen people die and name themselves here, and that's contributed to my, my outlook on, on anyone else's safety or my own safety. I'm not the one that has to be That's safe. Good, right? It's uh, not me hucking my carcass off cliffs down a 55 <laughs> degree slope. Right Keep this in your mouth before you ski. And uh, if something rips, then you're one step closer to having air if you do get buried. As a competitor, you're going to have to you know, really think about where you're jumping into, the kind of exposure you're above. It's going to bring out more of the mountaineer in all of us. And route finding is going to be really important, really knowing our line before we go into it. It's scary. It's scary out there, you know. But if you fall, you're going to be going a long ways. For the competitors, this is the most dangerous skiing event in the world. But behind the scenes, the support and safety teams also put a lot on the line. From fuel management to weather forecasting and avalanche analysis to mountain rescue and medical procedures, without careful planning and preparation, this mountain range will show them no mercy. It is very unusual to have poor stability this late in the year and is frustrating for everyone who has worked so hard to make this a great event. But to make matters worse, it seems like the weather is turning on them as well. Right now, I'm sitting in a fog bank up here, so I have no visual. We're all crossing our fingers, hoping the weather clears not only so we can uh, pull off the runs, but so we can go home and not spend the night out here on the glacier. The sun rises over Valdez, Alaska, with bald eagles flying against clear blue skies. It looks like the day they have all been waiting for. Excitement is in the air as Dean mobilizes three helicopters to lift people to the contest venue, high above the Prince William Sound. Far away from the rest of the world, Everyone is amazed at how spectacular it is. Got some of the best skiers in the world about to tackle one of the greatest venues ever in the history of skiing. I'm excited. I feel like I've had 40 cups of coffee already. We chose Terrible Edge because of the stability in the snowpack and uh, because it is a northwest facing slope and that's our best stability right now in the range. And then it's an aesthetic piece. It's a beautiful mountain. So the skiers are skiing a 1400 vertical piece of snow. It's about 48 degrees sustained with a lot of rocks and cliffs in there. You're looking at about a foot and a half of powder on the slope. So when you drop in, you cut in after your fifth turn, your slough's chasing you. So your idea is trying to ski away from your slough or stay up on a ridge line so your slough falls away from you. And when you get down above a cliff, you want to make sure that you've uh, timed it so your slough isn't hitting you right when you get to the edge. The guides inform each competitor of the snow conditions and rocky exposures found below. This is a very different skiing than the stunts you see in ski films. Once they leave the ridge, they are on their own. And not having made any practice runs, 
they have to ski with confidence but carefully. The more technical and steep the line they choose, the better the score. Big points are awarded for big air if you land it well. And fast, fluid skiing always impresses the judges. There is a fine line between pulling off a perfectly executed maneuver and taking a hard wipeout that could cost you points from your overall score or worse, serious injury or death. You know, we all know it's kind of a numbers game out here. And, uh, you know, we just got to do our best to make sound decisions and keep ourselves alive. Line selection is a huge part of this event. It demands creativity and big mountain experience. Unlike controlled ski run or race, big mountains offer a huge amount of terrain. You're dealing with all kinds of different aspects and snow conditions. You're skiing big open faces, tight couloirs, technical sections. It's accumulation of all these things that you've got to tie together in each run. this course we're like oh that's not so big we go yeah I can hack off that I can jump off that but no these mountains are big we watched one of the guys come down they're just tiny compared to the airs and the rocks behind skiing's beautiful imagery are professional cameramen who not only have to ski well but have to do it with heavy equipment on their backs this huge peak requires huge video coverage. Using multiple camera angles positioned all over the mountain and on opposing peaks, as well as for the first time during a major skiing competition, helmet-mounted video cameras with live audio puts the viewers in the boots of the skiers for the descent down a real Alaskan peak. It's easy to see the inconvenience of losing a ski just after dropping into your first turns on such a steep and open face. You can also feel the skier's uncertainty as he approaches the end of a large and overhanging cornice. From his point of view, he can't even see the landing area. Without knowing exactly where he is on the cornice, he has put himself in a dangerous situation as the whole ledge could break off and carry him and tons of snow down the rest of the mountain. He pulls off the jump, but injures his knee. The snow conditions have held well, even with the heavy loading on the snow layers. Hey, it's over. Congratulations, we've got our legs and our arms and our teeth and our health. Good job, Spencer. Health. No, 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 no. As soon as all the competitors clear Negative, the course, heard anything. Uh, we're going to set Dean down real quick. After months of planning and preparation for this event, and many challenging days of bad weather and difficult snow conditions, Dean and his team have pulled off the ultimate big mountain extreme skiing competition with style, great action and without injury. Now comes the snow safety team's reward to lay down some fresh tracks of their own. out there with clients and or competitors and they say man this is the best day of my life you know that's a reward you know it too you're saying to yourself yeah me too for all the hard work you put in all the times you've sat out weather all the times you've just escaped serious injury or possible death that's when you say to yourself yeah this is totally worth it
the science of extreme sports.